And she goes around the state teaching us how to do messaging. And one of the things I really liked about that messaging training, I went to it, it was three hours. But she helps you learn how to get your message down to a 30 second message so that you can talk about what's really important. Like I just talked to this brother here from the United Mine Workers about my story, which is about my grandfather who came to this country when he was 17 years old, an immigrant, a little over 108 years ago, crawling on his hands and knees for the rich guys in the Cherry Mine in Northern Illinois. And that mine caught fire. And my grandfather come out of that mine with his shoelaces on fire. And that's why I still do this stuff. Because I got a 20-year-old granddaughter and a 25-year-old granddaughter. And I'll be darned if they're going to crawl for 25 cents an hour. I'll be darned. She exemplifies that spirit. So, you know, that's a 30-second message. That's powerful. And we got to get those 30-second messages so we can go out and defeat this rotten governor we got. Another thing she's doing is near and dear to my heart. It should be near and dear to everybody in the labor movement. Is she's helping change the face of the labor movement in Champaign County. She's working with the Champaign-Urbana Initiative for Labor Diversity. <clears throat> with my brother, my union brother, Matt Kelly, who's president of the Trades and Labor Council over there, the BA for the plumbers. And they're figuring out how they're going to get diversity in the trades over there in Champaign County. And when they get that real good over there, they're going to show us how they did it. And we're going to do it in Sangamon County and all the other counties in our CLC. Because it's time, it's time, brothers and sisters, that the labor movement, that when you go out and you see a job, that it reflects your community. Not just a bunch of old gray-haired white guys like myself. We've got to have white men, but we've got to have people of color. And we've got to have women on these jobs. Because we're all about good jobs for everybody. Sisters and brothers, Stephanie Sewell, Corpato. together tonight talking about what I think is an urgent need for all of us in this room to be more dangerous. That's a great word, dangerous, and I'm not sure we always think about it. It evokes a feeling of expectation, volatility, that tingling on the back of your arms that causes your hair to rise, fear. We in this room should be causing that sensation. We need to become a source of danger for those that would dare to carry out injustice. We need to become the people that the corporate bullies and the politicians that they have bought and paid for fear. To quote that great speech from the Grapes of Wrath, wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, wherever there's a cop beating a guy. In other words, wherever there is injustice against the most vulnerable members of our communities, that is where we need to be. And those that are doing the starving, doing the beating, doing the harm, giving uh, corporate tax breaks to companies that don't need them, outsourcing jobs, taking away our health care, they need to quake when they see us come. And in thinking about, um, and in thinking about how we could be more of that kind of dangerous, I'm an historian, so I'm going to talk about two women who are not only two of my personal heroines, but I would argue are two very important and underappreciated figures in US history. Two women who during their time were called dangerous. Um, the first, who I'm sure you are familiar with or somehow you stumbled into the wrong dinner, um, is Mary Harris or Mother Jones. Uh, the second, who I also hope you are familiar with, is Lucy Gonzalez Parsons. In many ways, the life of these two women have some striking similarities. Mary Harris Jones was born in Cork, Ireland in 1837. Her family came to Canada and then the United States when famine swept their homeland. She moved to Memphis, where she found work, as, including as a dressmaker. She married a union man, which is always a good decision, uh, an iron molder, George Jones. The Jones family fell in hard times when after the Civil War, an economic downturn caused rapid layoffs in that industry, in the city, as in, in all, many other work sectors across the country. Then in 1867, the yellow fever 
ravage the poor and working class sections of Memphis and claim the lives of not only George, but all four of their children. And in the wake of this unfathomable personal tragedy, Mother Jones came to Chicago, where she opened a dressmaking business with a partner. Her work as a dressmaker gave Mary Harris uh, Jones a window into the great disparity between the poor and working class and wealthy Chicagoans. In her autobiography, she wrote, we worked, quote, we worked for the aristocrats of Chicago, and I had ample opportunity to observe the luxury and extravagance of their lives. Often while sewing for the lords and barons who lived in magnificent houses on Lakeshore Drive, I would look out at the plate glass windows and see the poor, shivering wretches, jobless and hungry, walking along the frozen lakefront. The contrast of their condition with that of the tropical comfort of the people from whom I sewed was painful to me. My employers seemed neither to notice or care. But Mary Harris Jones both noticed and cared. And when a few short years later, tragedy struck again, and she lost everything she owned in the Great Chicago Fire, she stayed in the city, a witness to the growing movement of working people that was building there. And in an age when, especially at that time, older people um, were t taken out of public life, she turned into public life and became an organizer for the mine workers. And, and as her stature in the labor movement grew, she took on the mantle of Mother Jones. She spent the rest of her life crisscrossing the nation, fighting for the rights of miners, bottle washers, streetcar drivers, child laborers, and other working people into her 80s. She died in 1930. In 1902, Mother Jones was arrested for her work organizing mine workers in West Virginia. At her trial, West Virginia District Attorney Reese Blizzard argued, there sits the most dangerous woman in America. She comes into a state where peace and prosperity reign, crooks her finger, and 20,000 contented men lie down their tools and walk out. Of course, peace and prosperity did not reign in West Virginia, coal country. The miners were far from contented. And although she was certainly a powerful voice of labor, she did not have the power to move 20,000 men with just the crook of a finger. But this quote demonstrates it, um, the national reputation that she had gained, and that description of the most dangerous woman in America stuck. Lucy Parsons was another woman who worked in Chicago as a dressmaker, meaning she too saw firsthand the great gulf between the haves and the have-nots of that city. The early lives of Lucy are uncertain, but she was likely born into slavery in 1853 or thereabouts in Waco, Texas. She was an African-American, Native American, Mexican-American woman. She fell in love with a fifth, uh, former Confederate soldier, Albert Parsons. Uh, they were married, although that was probably not legal in that state at that time. They had the audacity to register formally enslaved people to vote. The Klan didn't much care for that. They decided they needed to get out of Texas and came up to Chicago um, to look for new opportunities. There they became heavily involved in the labor movement, and Albert served as the editor of the working um, people's newspaper, The Alarm, one of the leading um, voices for the labor movement in that city. Lucy was a regular contributor to the paper. On May 1st, 1886, Lucy and Albert were at the head of the March of Workers down Michigan Avenue, part of the National Day of Action for eight hours work, for an eight hour work day, that saw more than a quarter of a million some estimates are as high as 350,000 workers taken to the streets across the country. Three days later, when a bomb went off in a workers' rally in Chicago's Haymarket, several policemen were killed, and Albert was one of eight men who were blamed. He was tried in a sham trial and executed by hanging, despite the lack of any evidence tying him directly to the bomb. And often, this is where Lucy's story ends. There's usually like one more sentence that's like, and then Lucy Parsons spent the rest of her life working for working people. But let's be clear, she lived 50 more years. She traveled to England giving speeches. Um, she, when she was in England, she discovered um, a kind of acceptance of free speech that wasn't available over here, and she came back and fought for that kind of free speech. Um, she was, she and Mother Jones, I said their lives had many similarities, were the first, the two women at um, the Industrial Workers of the World. And she became, Lucy became the editor of their newspaper, the, Liber, the Liberator, where she wrote about women's issues, demanded the right to contraception, pushed that union to care about issues that mattered to women. 
1931, when eight black youth were accused of raping two women in Alabama um, on a train. She was part of a group of people with the International Labor Defense of the Communist Party when nobody else would stand up for those boys who helped them get um, a defense and supported the Scottsboro Boys. Up to one year before her life, she was on the picket line talking to workers. Because of her radical organizing and writing and her demand for a fair trial for her husband and the other Haymarket accused, Lucy Parsons came to be known by the Chicago police as, quote, more dangerous than a thousand rioters. Both Mary and Lucy experienced a depth of hardship and personal tragedy in their lives. I think it is hard for many of us to imagine, including famine, disease, slavery, fire, and death of the people that they love the most. If it had been me and I had faced that kind of loss, I honestly don't know what I would have done. But these fires of tragedies formed in these two women a steel of determination and a sharpness of will to confront those who had propped up inequality and justice. In other words, it fostered a rage that made them dangerous. And I think we here today can learn from those dangerous women. Just what was it that made them so very dangerous to those in power? And how can we at this moment emulate that danger of these two mighty women? I hope we can talk more about this if we have time for a Q&A, but I have three ideas I want to share with you. Three ways we can look back to Mother Jones and Lucy Parsons and become inspired to be more dangerous. First, we need to speak out. Second, we need to show up. And third, we need to remember. We need to preserve the memory of those who fought against injustices in the past and those who fight in, against injustice today so that future generations can learn from our past and current struggles. So first, the examples of these two women demonstrate the profound importance of speaking out against social injustice. Both Lucy Parsons and Mother Jones spoke up often and unwaveringly about the injustices and inequalities they saw. Lucy Parsons wrote articles in her husband's paper, The Alarm, and spoke about revolution of the working class on Chicago street corners. I think it's hard to imagine how the, now the courage that must have taken for a woman, a woman of color, to speak like Lucy did in public. Even after the Chicago judicial system killed her husband, she was not silenced. She continued to tour the country, even traveling to England, giving speeches, writing about the exploitations of cap capitalism and the changes she thought needed to come for, the, for working people. As Mother Jones's renown in the labor movement grew, she used that stature to draw attention to the plight of some of the most exploited workers throughout the country. She traveled the country speaking to whomever would listen to the workers' plight. She took up her pen to write articles for newspapers and in publications like the United Mine Workers Journal. And it's important for us to remember that these two women were speaking out in a time when women did not have the same access to speaking out in the public sphere as men did. All too often, they found that even those who were supposed to be allies, sometimes even leaders in the labor movement, other reformers, were uncomfortable with the powerful and uncompromising messages of these two women. Take, for example, the famous Children's March that Mother Jones led from Philadelphia to President Theodore Roosevelt's summer home in New York in 1903. She was trying to bring attention to the plight of child labor. The march helped garner press attention to the issue and was a step forward in raising public consciousness of the terrible conditions faced by children in mills, mines, and other industries. Today, speaking out on an issue like child labor might seem kind of like a no-brainer, an easy thing to do. But historian Elliot Gorn wrote in his biography of Mother Jones, quote, it is easy to slight Mother Jones's courage in 1903, for hindsight makes her stand against labor by children appear unassailable. At the beginning of the century, however, the voices of powerful people, and many working class ones as well, still supported child labor. No consensus on the inviolability of childhood yet condemned the practice as barbaric. It's easy now to slight the courage that it took for these two women to speak out. I give lots of tours and talks about labor history throughout Illinois. Yesterday, I was with 150 tradeswomen on three buses for eight hours, driving all over the city. Um, learning about labor. And Mother Jones is one of the people I speak about the most frequently. And I always like to pause and remind my audience 
that Mother Jones did not know that she was going to be Mother Jones. She had no idea that one day there'd be a dinner in her honor with all of you good people here celebrating her life. There had to be times that she grew frustrated um, that the changes she dreamed of for working people would not come to fruition. Indeed, many of the basic federal legal protections workers have today were not realized until her death. But she kept traveling. She kept talking. She kept trying to use her voice to stand against capitalist greed. And that is really an important lesson for us in this room today, because that means we do not know the potential power of our own words and actions. If we find the unwavering courage to speak out and keep speaking out, even when people say to us, not now, be patient, this is not the time for that debate, or my favorite, why do you always have to be so political on Facebook? <laughs> and even when it seems like no one in power is listening, our job is to keep raising our voices and to do so unapologetically. Again, we can take another lesson from Mother Jones here, who did not pull her punches when she spoke to about the injustices she was fighting. I'm going to now go through some of my very favorite ones of her quotes. I'm sure most of you have heard some of these. Quote, I asked the man in prison once how he happened to be there, and he said he had stolen a pair of shoes. I told him if he had stolen a railroad, he would be a United States senator. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, no matter what the fight, don't be ladylike. God Almighty made women, and the Rockefeller gang of thieves made the ladies. So one of the things is, Jim talked a little bit about messaging. Mother Jones was funny. She knew how to turn a phrase. She knew how to um, work the media and the press to get a good quote in the paper. Another one of my favorite quotes that's probably a little bit lesser known is, quote, there is something wrong in our social makeup. When we make criminals out of the youths, put them in jail, hire wardens and guards, and pay them to take care of them and tax the people. Your whole system, my friends, is wrong. And I think we could say that today. Mother Jones called industrialists and the politicians who supported them thieves. She called the US system of incarceration wrong. She named injustice as she saw it. And there is power in such naming. So did Lucy Parsons. One of my very favorite quotes by Lucy was, quote, passivity when slavery is stealing over us is a crime. Think about that for a moment. Lucy Gonzalez was not um, speaking abstractly, she had been enslaved. She understood in a way that we cannot possibly the full weight of the word slavery. It is a word she chooses to use often in her speeches and writings about the exploitation of working people and especially the exploitation of women. She is issuing a warning that if we remain passive, that this exploitation can grow, that slavery can steal back over a society slowly while we are too busy to respond. And most importantly, she is exhorting us to action. And that leads me to the second way that studying the examples of Mother Jones and Lucy Carson can encourage us to be dangerous. Because these women knew sometimes it is not enough to use our voices to demand justice. Sometimes we have to put our bodies on the line. In 1915, Lucy Parsons was at the front of a march to bring attention to hunger, poverty, and unemployment in Chicago. A newspaper of the day told the story, quote, Lucy Parsons, widow of Albert Parsons, martyr of the great 1886 struggle for the eight hour day, was arrested yesterday while leading a protest procession of Chicago's unemployed and hungry men, women, and children. The peaceful protest began in front of Hall House and continued down Halstead Street. The protesters were attacked by police with revolvers drawn after refusing the order to disperse. It seemed the protesters had been denied a permit and were therefore making their voices seen and heard without the official sanction of Chicago city government. Of course, Chicago city government was never going to sanction such a march of hungry, unemployed people into the heart of downtown at that time. I want to pause a minute and really reflect on the story. I want us to imagine Lucy Parsons marching down Halstead Street toward downtown Chicago at the front of about 2,000 people. Above her stretches a banner emblazoned with one simple word in large white letters, hunger. 
A new song is taken up by the marchers, sung for the very first time anywhere that day. And that song was Solidarity Forever, which we're going to sing later. It has now become the anthem of our labor movement. I wonder if as she marched, did Lucy look to the spot where her husband used to march with her? Was her husband's face in the front of her mind when she was arrested by the very same justice or injustice system that had killed him nearly three decades earlier? Lucy knew full well the potential risk she faced in leading that unsanctioned hunger march. And yet she still decided to put her body on the front of that line. Mother Jones also put her body on the front lines in the fight for the basic rights of working people. She was placed under arrest multiple times for refusing to stop her union organizing activities. In 1914, she was held under arrest in Colorado for more than three months. She was 77 years old. According to historian Elliot Gorn, the jail that she had, was held in had been condemned by the Colorado State Board of Charities and Corrections as unfit for human habitation. Later, Mother Jones would describe how she had to save off rats with a beer bottle while incarcerated there. Again, I'd like to take, us, take a minute and try to imagine that experience. What must it have been like for a woman of her age to spend night after night under such conditions? Once while Mother Jones was held under arrest in West Virginia, she was quoted as saying in an interview in the United Mine Workers Journal, quote, if they want to stop my protest, let them stand me up a tree, I'm sorry, stand me up a wall, against a wall, and shoot me. <laughs> yeah. And what I want to get at is Mother Jones and Lucy Parsons knew the cost of being dangerous. I think often when we think about them, we think of banners, waving, songs, singing, people marching, but their story is also the story of lonely nights spent in prison cells, of going to bed without your husband. And we have to count that cost if we dare to be dangerous. Both Mother Jones and Lucy Parsons were also considered dangerous because they were willing to transgress what was considered the acceptable lines of behavior for women of their day and put their very bodies on the line for their causes. Every time Lucy Parsons gave a speech on a street corner, every time Mother Jones spoke to a group of miners and their families in a mining camp, these were wildly dangerous acts. And because of these acts, these women endured prison more than once. They knew the potential consequences of their actions, and yet they acted anyway. To put it more simply, they showed up. If we want to be dangerous like Mother Jones and Lucy Gonzalez Parsons, it is not enough for us to speak out. We have to show up. We have to get out of our comfort zones and go to places where the most vulnerable people are fighting for their rights. It is not enough to sign on to the latest change.org petition, forward that Facebook story that is making the rounds, or even write a letter to the editor, although we should be doing and should keep doing all of those things. We have to demonstrate that same commitment to put our bodies on the line. Whether that means marching on a local picket line, even on a day it is raining, going to places like St. Louis or Charlottesville to stand up with protesters, knocking on doors for the new candidates who are going to change um, our system of government here, and especially the women that are running for office, I'm just going to say, since this is a speech about Mother Jones and Lucy Parsons, even on days when you would rather not, when you are tired, when you have worked extra, this might be difficult for many of us. And one of the most radical things that we could do is go to the living room of a friend or a family member and have a difficult conversation about race and labor in America today. If we're going to be dangerous, really dangerous, we need to take part in the very important project of passing the fight for justice and working people from one generation to the next. Both Mother Jones and Lucy Parsons did not only participate in the fights of their day, they worked hard to ensure that those fights were remembered. Mother Jones made sure that there was a record of her autobiography. She worked with journalist Maryfield Parton to relay the stories of the labor struggle she had participated in during her long life. 
In vivid language, she told these stories. And it's clear that Mother Jones was hoping to inspire the next generation to take up the cause that she fought for. Likewise, Lucy Parsons actively participated in the act of me memory making. Indeed, it is not a stretch to say that Haymarket has such a prominent place in our labor history in no small part because of Lucy's insistence that it be remembered. That we remember her husband and others who died for the cause of working people and the great solidarity of 1886 when thousands of workers um, stood up for the right of the eight hour workday and basic dignity for workers. Lucy Parsons wrote and smoke, spoke about Haymarket often. In an article written four decades after the event at Haymarket, she said, quote, does this rising generation know that those who inaugurated the eight hour day were put to death at the command of capital? Until 40 years ago, men, women, and children toiled 10 and often 12 hours a day in factories for a mere pittance. And children from six to nine years of age had to work to keep up the family. You can hear the anxiety in her opening question as she wonders if young people know their history. This is an anxiety we should all feel. I truly believe, and I, again, am, after all, an historian, that one of the reasons that we are facing some of the things we are facing today, the attack on workers' rights, the attack on women's rights, is because we have not done enough to pass down our stories from one generation to the next. Dinners like this are important. Restoring Mother Jones's grave site, the work that the AFL and uh, the UMWA did is important. We need more events like this. We need more historical markers on our landscape commemorating the places where working people stood up for their rights, organized strikes, and shed their blood to try to build a better life. We need to insist that teachers have the resources to teach about labor, something which is actually mandated, but of course unfunded, by the state of Illinois. And we need to be sure we are recording our present fights, that we keep a record of these current struggles for future generations. We in this room have the potential to be dangerous, but not if we are silent, not if we don't show up, and not if we don't remember our past. And right now, I want to give you three just very general suggestions on ways, easier ways, that you could be dangerous. First, have two difficult conversations before this year is up. Find somebody that you need to talk to about labor, about race in this country that matters to you, that you have a relationship with, and go have that conversation. Then, go find somebody that makes you uncomfortable, somebody who challenges you, and ask them how you could be a better ally in this fight for working people. Second, go somewhere that makes you uncomfortable. Go somewhere on a day that you are tired. Go somewhere that it is hard to get to. Go somewhere that is going to cost you money. Go somewhere that is going to cost you time. Find some group of people that are fighting, that are vulnerable, that need you on the line. You don't even have to be at the front of the line. But take time to put your body where the fight is happening. And third, and this one, if you don't want to do those other two harder things, do this. Read a book. Pick a book of labor history Pick a couple of people that you know, get together in a room, read it, and talk about it. A lot of people ask me how the Chicago Teachers Union did what they did in 2012. I get this question a lot when I teach labor history. How did that union take, basically take over the city of Chicago for a couple days in 2012? And I always tell them, every time I'm asked this question, I'm like, well, they formed a book club. Karen Lewis, who was the president of that union, she was a teacher who was worn out, tired, ready to retire, sick of her union, and sick of her job. And there was a book club going on in the union, and one day, a friend of hers came up to her and said, listen, why don't you come with me to this book club? I think you're going to like it. She's like, nah, I'm tired. I don't have time for this. And they're like, no, I really think you're going to like it. She got together with a group of about five or six people, and they were reading books about education in Chicago. And, education in the country and they started having a conversation and as they started having that conversation they were like well maybe we should go to this community school group and talk to them a little bit about what's happening and maybe we should go over here and that group grew and then one day they took over their union and then one day they took over Chicago I'm not saying that you have to take over a major city but what I am saying is pick a book read the book discuss it with other people and think about how the stories of the past 
the people like Mother Jones, the people like Lucy Parson can inspire us to build a better labor movement, to build a stronger labor movement. So we need to speak out, we need to show up, and we need to remember those that came before us and make sure that we are living lives that inspire the generation that's going to come after us. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Terry Reed, and what a great speech by Stephanie. Thank you very much. Here in Springfield at the Public Library, it's the Lincoln Public Library, um, we'll have a, a private screening. It's open to the public, but it's a public free screening of a film documentary, Blood on the Mountain. We, we are so lucky to have Mary Lynn Evans, who was producer, director, writer, mover of that whole production here tonight. And she's gonna to explain to us tonight uh, uh, the background and what leads up to the film and why it's so important to get this out in every home in the country so that they get educated on what's going on here. It's happening in West Virginia, but it's happening all over the country in different ways. Uh, first, I want to tell you, Teresa, what an honor it is to be here with all of you. Um, the AFL-CIO is, is one of our outreach partners on this film, and um, that meant everything to this film. Um, because there was only one person to tell that story, and that was Rich Stromka and Cecil Roberts to help us understand um, I grew up in Bulltown, West Virginia. I was uh, raised by my grandparents on a 2,000 acre farm that when I was 17, the Army Corps of Engineers took for <clears throat> a dam. And so my grandparents lost everything. We all lost everything. And um, that feeling of injustice and powerlessness and suffering never left me. Um, so I left West Virginia at 17 and uh, went all over the world, um, determined never to go back to West Virginia to live. I, I was warned about the siren, the call that calls you back home down there. And it happened to me 17 years ago. Um, I came back to make the Appalachians, which um, I hope many of you have seen on PBS. Um, it's a three-hour series with Johnny Cash's last interview and has been seen by over 100 million people. Um, and we also had a companion book and CD, and we're incredibly proud of that. Um, but seven years ago, Massey UBB in Coal River, West Virginia exploded, and um, 29 coal miners were killed. And that's where Blood on the Mountain began for us. Um, you know, when I was a little kid growing up on a farm, we didn't have electricity. Uh, we didn't have a telephone until I was 12, which is why my son says I talk incessantly on the telephone <laughs> once we finally got wired up. But what we did was, my grandpa would sit and tell us stories about coming from Ireland over to America and tell stories and history. And that, that's what I grew up on. And I realized later in life, that makes for a good documentary filmmaker. Someone that wants to hear stories and, and that history matters to them. I didn't know about Mother Jones, even though I was born and raised in West Virginia, um, <coughs> until I made the Appalachians, actually, and went to Ireland. And realized that even in Cork, Ireland, where she was born, her memory had, had faded. Um, we reenacted the 1921 march on Blair Mountain. And a thousand people from literally all over the world came to southern West Virginia <coughs> to reenact the march on Blair Mountain in 1921. Um, we also did 
Appalachia Rising, where 5,000 hillbillies showed up at the Capitol to talk about issues for us that matter to us as people. Um, and we organized. And, you know, it's so much, just as, as Tiffany said, about Mother Jones. You know, someone told me once, I said, boy, you know, thank God Mother Jones said history's a weapon, and I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm going to use history as a weapon here. <laughs> and how powerful it is. You know, we had no idea if anybody would even see blood on the mountain, uh, but Netflix bought us. And so I'll add to Stephanie's list of things to do. Get a house party, watch Blood on the Mountain for free on Netflix, and talk to your friends about it. Uh, we also have an educational guide for Blood on the Mountain so that it's going into school systems all over the country. And to see the success of it, how strange it is that I turned out to make a film that is the history of labor in America because labor in America was born at the Battle Blair Mountain in 1921, which led to the formation of the great United Mine Workers of America. And God bless, God bless every one of those, those coal miners that have sacrificed their lives um, and are being shown such disrespect by our federal government, by our state government, um, those pensions were promised to them. And just because the coal industry found a way through federal bankruptcy court to rip them off of their <coughs> promised health care and pensions, um, we have to stand up and fight for them. We have to stand up and fight for the retirees. We have to stand up. You know, before there was a UMWA, there were hellraisers in West Virginia. We came first, and 15,000 of us marched on Blair Mountain, 50 miles they walked over five days. The women lived in tents underground because the coal companies would come through and shoot them from the trains or drop bombs on them from the sky. Blair Mountain was the largest labor insurrection ever in American history. And to this day, we are fighting just to have a monument place there. I just want to thank you all. I'll, I'll be with you all tomorrow. Um, and I hope that you'll watch the film and share it. And uh, I'm to give all of you greetings and love from the people of West Virginia, from the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum, uh, from the museum at Blair Mountain, and from all the activists and hellraisers and great-granddaughters of Mother Jones, who is, is our agitator, um, that, you know, we know how to move forward because we now know our own history. And we are no longer condemned to have our history repeat itself. And, I mean, it's, it's been the honor of my life to have, have made the three films I have and to make Blood on the Mountain. And um, I've committed myself to... Um, to organizing and being a hellraiser until the day I join Mother Jones. So thank you all so much and, and thank you and it's been really such an honor. Thank you so much. We, uh, Mary Lynn and Stephanie will take any questions you have if uh, we want to have a little dialogue here. We've got two great uh, women who are very knowledgeable and now's a chance to uh, ask some questions. What was the most interesting or surprising thing that you learned during the production of Blood on the Um Did I put my own life in jeopardy? Um, you know, uh, we filmed two films, Cold Country and Blood on the Mountain, over the last 10 years in southern West Virginia. I, I like to say I filmed and fought in the war on coal, or the war by coal. 
Um, but listen, it was physically dangerous. I mean, I, I've had death threats. I had a gun pulled on me. And, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, um, documentary filmmakers like Josh Fox and, and other great documentary filmmakers, you know, you devote your life to the, the film you're making and, and you have no other life, you know. My dear friend Carrie Herman's here and, you know, she realized seven years ago that I was off on a mission from God, I guess, <laughs> and that I was compelled to make this story. And, um, yeah, you, you sacrifice a lot, but let me tell you, I've had the greatest life in the world being an activist, being an organizer, and the people you hang out with. I mean, it's like if everybody knew how fun it was and how awesome it would, everybody would be a union organizer. <laughs> so I guess that's a surprising thing. Yes, she asked if, if coal mining was still a viable industry in West Virginia. Um, no, it's not. I don't believe, I know there's no UMWA coal miners left in Kentucky, and I don't believe there is any West Virginia left. Active UMWA? All right, well, that's great. Um, because, yeah, I mean, as you know, union membership has, you know, fallen so much. And most of those coal companies, like Massey, they were all non-union. Uh, that was the problem. I mean, the non-union mines were the mines that exploded that are, are still so dangerous. But no, I mean, I, I think everyone understands that, you know, things have, have moved on in so many ways that, you know, it's really a desperate situation in southern West Virginia at this point. Um, the elementary schools have closed because of depopulation. Once the coal companies closed, people moved out. Uh, we have an opioid <coughs> epidemic. Um, and there are no jobs. So it's, it's, it's so dire in West Virginia. Um, we started a Mother Jones Community Foundation there and have been talking with Kroger and Kroger uh, which is union, is um, started a program called Zero Hunger, Zero Waste, where they are donating all their expired food at the end of a day to community groups like ours to distribute. Um, we've also brought in uh, Fair Shakes Legal Service for free legal services. What we're doing is going in to provide funding support, asking our rich friends to help our poor friends, uh, because they need it now and just really doing it for ourselves. No federal money, no state money. It's all private funding. And all of the services are done in the communities. Well, I've heard, you know, it said that coal is coming back. <laughs> so, uh, uh, which is what Trump said. And I was wondering how you were <laughs> Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, I mean. Repeat the question. Oh. He, he was arguing about coal, coal, is, is coal really coming back? That Trump keeps saying that it's coming back. But, you know, you're either going to believe Donald Trump or your own lying eyes. I mean, which is going to be. Because, you know, you got to pick one. And, uh, no. Yeah. But uh, I'm just wondering, because they did vote for Trump, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so well, I mean, you know, the Democrats, Hillary didn't really say much to them, and Bernie was, more people actually in West Virginia voted for Bernie Sanders than voted for Donald Trump. I'd like to point that out. Uh, but yes, I mean, listen, you want to believe, you know, and... Donald Trump is saying, I'm going to take care of it. And at this, this point where nobody's doing anything to help the coal miners, uh, of course they believed it. But I've got two brothers that are coal miners, and they ain't going back to work. Um, a lot of the coal mines that are opening small places, a, a lot of them are hiring 18, 19-year-old kids. Um, 
you know, who fly the Friends of Coal sign, not the Friends of Coal Miner sign. So. But come to West Virginia. We'd love to have you down at Mate Wine. We'll take you on a tour. <laughs> but, you know, come to West Virginia and, and meet your union brothers and sisters down there uh, because they, they need your help at this point. Oh, I do have a question. It's actually for Stephanie, though. Uh, and and uh, you, one of the things that you work on regularly is messaging, and I, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I think we're headed towards a time where attention spans are shrinking, and they're getting tiny. You know, people can only do a soundbite for, uh, what, 140 characters or something? So how do you combat that, and how do you, uh, how short does a message have to be to work? We brought back the organizer, um, or the, the lead negotiator, who's a dear friend of mine, came back to talk to the campus about why she thought we won. And she said, real simply, we had better stories. We had better stories. And we empowered our members to tell the stories. So we had members talking to the media, not the business agents, right? Not the presidents, no offense to the business agents and the presidents in this room, but we empowered rank and file members to say, I have a family, I have kids, if this doesn't change, I'm gonna have to go on food stamps, I'm gonna have to drop out of school, this has to change, right? And we empowered hundreds of members to talk to their students on campus, talk um, to their parents back home, right? To put pressure on, on the employer. But that, I think, at our core, look, bigger minds than me need to think about where our big message is gonna be, right? But what I think in this room, we have powerful stories, and we should be telling them. We should be telling them to the media, we should be telling them to politicians that don't listen, but most importantly, we should be telling them to people who vote and try to get them to engage in the political process. Because I think the big message of this last election is just the disengagement. I think people and are- despair. Yeah, despair and disengagement. I think people are sick of, of the whole process, and the only way to get them back is to talk about things that really matter. I, Stephanie, I, I loved your I loved your speech, and thank you so much for for what you said. But you know, as a documentary filmmaker, when you're able to reach literally hundreds of millions of people, um, and one thing I do want to say to all of you is, any labor union can license Blood on the Mountain for free. We want every labor union in America to show this. One of the problems is young, young workers, they have no idea what the history of labor is in America. They have no idea that people bled and died for the rights they have, for the rights every American worker has. It came from the blood of West Virginians on Blair Mountain. It came from the UMWA. And I mean, I can't say that enough. But I do, maybe it's because I'm a filmmaker and I'm a fan of Norma Ray, but I found out one messaging thing, and here it is, yeah. union. Yeah. There, there's a short message, <laughs> union. Oh, and Rosemary gave me this. On the other side, it says, I am told I'm a dangerous citizen, and I'm glad I am. So, I'm not the most dangerous woman in America, but I think I might be in West Virginia, and I'm trying to you know, proselytize the word, so. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's Potter River Basin now. For them to be able to and the black men surface, and, yes, right. Surface mine that, and we've got seven continuous routed trains from Wyoming to Kincaid, Illinois, and it's less expensive. They say, of course, they're the number crunchers than what it cost Peabody Mine 
to go down 300 feet right across the highway. Okay. And I will never forget the displaced Peabody coal miners that lost their job. And my <coughs> yes, because Peabody was. In Peabody. Right. But he passed away just trying to get to work one midnight shift. Well, and Peabody was the first coal company to try out what would happen in federal bankruptcy court. And when they found out they could go bankrupt and cost minors their pension and health care, that's what they did. I know some gentlemen that did lose their pensions, and one fellow needed 23 more months to qualify, and he never got that chance. And they sacrificed for their families and themselves. Well, and in the film is Rich Trumka and um, Cecil Roberts from UMWA at the uh, Charleston Civic Center. The, the, there were like 5,000 UMWA miners there um, because Patriot and Peabody and Dart and then now fall went bankrupt. But it's a warning to every worker in this country. I mean, the difference between a worker and a slave is a union. I mean, they call it minimum wage for a reason. I mean, they were pretty protected, you know, and make you buy your own pick and shovel and explosives like they did in 1921 if they get away with it. So they've not changed. My, my friend Hawkeye Dixon, who's the head of UMW 1448 Mate One, he said, well, I tell you, Mary Lynn, they, uh, they're just still the same thugs they used to be. They just wear $10,000 suits now. And I said, well, you know, Hawkeye, some of us are still union thugs. Some of us just look like documentary filmmakers and housewives, <laughs> but we're thugs, and, you know. And, you know, we have, to, we have to build up the unions. You know, the unions need the help of every worker. We can't rely on them to carry the load for everyone. And, uh, and that's why Stephanie, you know, standing up and speaking out and being courageous because it's righteous. Um, and it will make you feel really good. And like I said, you have lots of friends, but with really great friends raising hell for labor. I mean, I highly recommend it. <laughs> say, no, we're not putting up with the kind of crap that's been going on in this country, with the way the corporations have been attacking us, attacking our unions, and just trying to destroy our way of life, something that Mother Jones and these people whose names are on this monument spent their lives fighting against, fighting for the rights of working people. That's what we need to begin to do again now. And that's why I think this time at this monument is a time for us to say, stop. We're going to reclaim our rights as working people in this country. We're not going to put up with any more of the kind of crap that's been going on here. Yeah. One of the proudest moments I had in the mine workers was when Murray American Energy banned me from their mine product. <laughs> so I, I started handling cases for the mine workers. I started doing arbitrations, uh, grievances, and, and, and the higher step of the grievance procedure. And uh, anybody who works for the mine workers, this is, this is another thing I think Mother Jones would love about the mine workers now. When you all got hired somewhere, you filled out your employment application, you started working there. They gave you like an employee handbook. Here's what you have to do. This is what you have to do in order to, to, to make ends meet here. When you start working for the mine workers, you know what you get? A little blue book of court orders. This is all the stuff you've done that, that you still have sanctions against you for. 
<laughs> and it's, it's the absolute truth. It brings you right into the moment of knowing that a long time ago, there was a line drawn in the sand. There was a line drawn in the sand, and you got to pick which side you're on. All right. The legacy, you know, the legacy of Mother Jones is picking the side of that line that you're on. Can you imagine? Can you imagine losing everything you had, everything that you held dear in your life, your family, and starting over again? Starting over. Finding the strength within yourself to start over again after you've lost everything that you hold dear. Working yourself back up for what most of us consider the American dream and then having it all stripped away from you again. You know, I think what happened to Mary Harris Jones at that time is she had a repurposing of her soul. You know, she, she said, Reformation, like education, is a journey, not a destination. What she meant by that was she had discovered that to live is a verb. Your life is not the sum of your possessions. It's not the sum of what you have. Even though I still believe the American dream is starting with nothing but opportunity and having something at the end of the at the end of the life. That is the mere but for her the American dream was making sure everybody had the chance to get that. Having the chance to get that, you know, in this country, in this country, you can only be free. You can only be free if you have opportunity. You can only have opportunity if you have power. And you only have power in this country if you have votes. That's where all our power comes from. And what Mary Harris Jones, what Mother Jones told us was when you come together as a collective, you have those votes. You have that power. You can change the world. You can change the world. And her legacy, her legacy is in our ability to share, to share in collective bargaining, to share in the collective rights of, of, of mankind. Listen, I don't know how to necessarily say this, but my whole life, which seemed like it was on this normal track, working at the mine, getting my pension, putting the time into it, just got completely turned around. It got completely turned around, and it, to be quite honest, it's frightening sometimes. I, you know, look, I, I don't have this big, long legacy, this big, long history behind me. When I talked about working at, three years ago, I was at the face. I was cutting coal at the face three years ago. It's, it's, it's a completely different world for me now. But while I stand over the grave of, of Mother Jones, I see her spirit today, every day. I go to the office. Don't be afraid to speak out. Don't be afraid to speak out. Show up. You need to go places. You need to make yourself be there. And don't forget where you came from. Well, I think we can sum that up in one sentence. Pick a fight and raise hell. WA. And when I heard that, I knew I should probably come back because I think my boys wanted me. So I came back. And what a world. What a world. Well, I started looking and there wasn't any coal mines around. So I had to walk and I walked and I walked. I finally found a coal mine. But the workers there, they thought I was a crazy old lady. <laughs> they said, well, we don't need you, and we don't need no damn union. Well, I got news for them. They do need a union. Amen. And we do need to start really the battle because we're losing everything that I fought for. Everything I fought for is being taken away. So we need to get out there, and we need to start the battle to keep the unions going. 
because like I've always said, you can pray for the dead, but you got to fight like hell for the living. Thank you. Take the fight to Blair Mountain before the dawn, before the dawn. Yeah, take the roads, take the rails by storm. Deliver us from the gathering storm. Because we know that we can win, because we know we have to win. And it's it's just such an amazing day for me to be here. And I'm going to post this and tell all my friends in West Virginia who send their love and greetings here today. Um, the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum in May 1, uh, UMWA 1440 May 1. Uh, Once you all know that we're still alive and, and we're kicking down there and we're going to keep kicking until we get the respect that we deserve and solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. In our hands is placed the power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. For solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever. For the union 